Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and after a somewhat unfortunate COVID-related hiatus, today me and my still not fully recovered voice return to the Cold Bog to complete another chapter in our adventure with Specs and the Cult of Jinx. Before we get going, also quick announcement, in the last channel update video I revealed that we are going to play XCOM 2 very soon, and I put up a separate video a few days ago detailing how you can join that series if you are a patron supporter. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and watch that video, you can find it linked on screen and down below. Now, last time we left off, we funneled all of our colonists through the Tree Torment ritual to give them their ritual scars for the Pain is Virtue meme, we also successfully married Maniac and Thoraya, and then finished the episode by hacking a space drone for more info about the Horn of Edmo, all while being attacked by multiple waves of hostile tribespeople. Spex and Thoraya are still recovering from the injuries sustained in that fight, with Spex narrowly escaping death after a spear pierced her heart, but of course, life in the swamp does not stop. Using some of the jade we have looted from our enemies, we are now constructing one more slab bed for Retini, and then we once again make some changes to our dryads. Thoraya's two dryads, Solaba and Karma, have produced so much medicine in their short time with us that I think having two of them might be overkill. So instead, we are now changing the two of them to berry maker dryads, so that we have a constant influx of berries even in the winter, which will also ensure that we always have some plant matter to make kibble for our muffalos. At 40 berries per day per dryad, we are looking at some pretty good production here, although it will now take 5 days for Solova and Karma to morph into their new forms. In the meantime, we can fortify the riverside with some leather sandbags, and Thoraya can put up two more jade slab beds for Coco and Jagna. Not only will this give them a small mood bonus because of our ideology, but the beds also come with a solid beauty rating that a wooden or stone slab bed would not be able to reach. Maniac can also upgrade his cloth tribal wear to some warmer muffalo wool, and as Jackna then finishes a leather armor from bearskin, Spex can equip it for a serious boost to cold and damage resistance. Just in that moment, we are also informed of a hunting worksite nearby, although nearby is a bit of a stretch, as the camp is actually pretty far away from our village. And because traveling through the swamp is slow enough as it is already, and even slower during the winter by the way, I don't think we are going over there, even though the 300 units of heavy fur would make for some great armor material. Instead, we can now name our latest woodmaker dryad Chicken Egg, as always chosen from the list of patrons in the naming rights tier and above. This is now the first woodmaker dryad that belongs to Coco Skaran Tree, while Kipsor is still going strong over by the Anima Tree. That means wood production will slowly pick up pace again, and that's definitely needed, as we have no other choice but to use wood to build the rest of our exterior wall here, since the ground surrounding it is too muddy to support anything else. In the evening then, our colony grows once more, as Muffalo Mother Tina gives birth to another calf, and this time the name that was randomly selected is Cheese Man, so congratulations and welcome to Liviana. The night then brings with it some dangers, as Randy sends a pack of man-hunting polar bears our way. Now, if we could perhaps kill one or two of them without their bodies rotting away immediately, that would be great to obtain more bear skin, so let's go hunting. We are using all except for our melee colonists Thoraya and Rodini for this one, and with the river between us and the bears we should get off a good number of shots here. In addition to that, it also seems like the pack has split up on their way over here, so Thoraya and Rodini will stay locked inside until the problem is taken care of. As you can see, our psychic abilities are doing a great job at slowing the bass down even further, and so the first group of three here is quickly taken out. Bear number 4 is then still far enough away to allow everyone to fire their volleys from a safe distance, and that leaves us with only two, and shortly after with only one. That one then first wanders into one of our traps, completely without any cause for it whatsoever, and a few moments later we get into range to take it out, as well as its companion that briefly got up again. 
Slaughtering all the downed animals unfortunately does not provide us with any usable corpses, so their bodies are immediately dumped into the river as we begin the next small construction process and close off the northern entrance to our base with another granite wall. Specs, meanwhile, can harvest that Garenlin seed that sprouted a while ago, and yes, despite being connected to one Garenlin tree already, she will now plant another close by to those of Coco and Thoraya. Now, for some reason, we do not get any ideology development points for this, although with the tree connection meme we should, and we did get them for the first trees we planted, so perhaps someone in the comments can tell me what happened here. In any case, Spex will for a change now also attend the tree connection ritual all by herself. We have already done this once with her and I don't think we need to bother the rest of the colony with it again. The plan here is to eventually have Spex take care of a tree that's better protected and closer to the others. And as our colony's leader, we will also try to keep her pruning hours low, which is why we will now make this our new medicine maker tree with a connection strength of only 10%, allowing us to maintain one dryad with minimal pruning effort. Woodmaker Dryad Kipsaw's tree, meanwhile, will slowly but steadily be neglected until Kipsaw himself then disappears back into the tree. We could also chop it down, but that would cause a serious mood penalty, and the Garanlin moss around the tree gives a nice beauty bonus for everyone meditating at the anima tree. Now, following the news that Tina is pregnant yet again, we are now feeding our muffalos some simple meals, as we have run out of material to make kibble with. We will be cutting it a bit close with our food supply for the next few days, especially because we don't really have that many animals worth hunting on the map, but I think we should be fine until those berry maker dryads hatch. The rest of the day then remains fairly uneventful, and so we can skip ahead to the next morning, which begins with a shooting inspiration for Maniac. And we will make use of his increased aim right away by hunting a lone arctic fox, just to keep up the meat supply for now. Afterwards, we also receive another quest, this one promising us a jump pack, if we can defeat the eight man-hunting arctic foxes guarding it. That in itself should not be too difficult, but the item stash is once again pretty far away, so since we have 24 days to complete this quest, we will probably wait until spring to launch a caravan to get it. Back in the base, meanwhile, we have put Spex and Maniac on full-time meditation duty, because we want Spex to level up to the next Psycaster rank as quickly as possible. There are some pretty powerful abilities available at those higher ranks, and since I think we will stay Neolithic for a little while longer, those could be pretty important down the line. A little bit of hunting is then sprinkled in for Maniac, that shooting inspiration needs to be used after all, but otherwise the day remains mostly uneventful. In the late afternoon, Coco starts working on a marble sculpture, and a few hours later, Anima Grass Patch number 20 is here, and with that we can now give Spex her next Psy rank. Once again, Maniac will not attend the ceremony, as the quality rating here only determines how many patches of grass are restored afterwards, and we can easily grow that back with some meditation. So instead, Maniac goes hunting again, and as he kills a raccoon here, his wife Thoraya now also receives an inspiration. For the next 8 days, she will get a bonus on trading, so let's hope that a caravan passes by soon. Around midnight then, Spex gains her third level as a Psycaster, and we even restore one patch of grass. More importantly though, she now learns a Vertigo Pulse, one of three possible abilities unlocked at this level, and a pretty good one at that, as it can incapacitate small groups of enemies for a short period of time by making them nauseous. A few hours later, an Aurora brightens up the swamp, and on the following morning the construction of our exterior wall continues. Jackna also finishes a Thrombo fur leather armor, by far the most potent leather armor we have right now, and as such it will go on our combat specialist Maniac, also giving him a temperature resistance of up to minus 50 degrees Celsius. The armor's stats are then definitely something to behold, a sharp resistance of 114% is actually on the level of marine armor if I'm not mistaken, although the blunt armor is much worse, so I don't think this will break the game, especially since the leather armor also does not protect Maniac's arms or neck. For now though, it is probably the best we can produce, at least until we unlock plate armor. Jackna's crafting skill, by the way, is also coming along nicely. You can see it here, she is getting close to level 9 and should start pumping out good quality items with some regularity soon. Now, the remainder of the day once again passes by without anything of note happening until we receive an interesting quest in the evening. 
A trader is asking us to attract the attention of a smoke spewer machine that is guarded by some turrets and a lone pirate, and in exchange they offer some, well, to be honest, somewhat underwhelming loot. Still, 12 units of Glitter World medicine might make the occasional gutworms much less of a problem, and since the site is only guarded by a single enemy, we might actually take this quest. For now though, we have two days to make a decision, so let's not rush anything and instead skip ahead to the next day. After an uneventful morning, we can now watch as Coco shares another batch of wool off of Muffalo Shadow Mage, and that is actually what we have been waiting for to accept this quest, as Shadow Mage will accompany our adventurers on their mission to carry some of the potential loot. And we are in fact accepting the quest for the Glitter World Medicine, and a few seconds later the smoke spewer activates, so let's take a look at how far we need to travel, but usually these things tend to be pretty close by. And indeed, just a few tiles away from Liviana, we find the mission site, right next door to a few other potential places of interest, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. For now, we can pack our bags, or more specifically, those of Maniac and Took, who will once again form the heart of our small adventuring party. Like I said, they will take Shadow Mage with them for some extra carrying capacity, and other than that, just a bit of food and medicine. Since the smoke spewer is now our problem, the reward also arrives immediately, and so we can put 12 units of powerful Glitter World medicine in our storage room now. I would like to imagine that our colonists don't have the faintest idea what it actually is, but perhaps they run into a situation where testing it out might be necessary. Now, as Maniac, Took and Shadow Mage leave the map, Specs takes over hunting duties to keep the food supply running, and a few moments later we witness the arrival of the Royal Tribute Collector, although in the absence of slaves or gold we don't really have anything to give them, and we're not exactly trying to make friends with the Empire anyway. Jekna, meanwhile, has produced a pigskin cape, not really anything special in terms of protection, but it makes use of the vast amounts of pigskin we have lying around, can be worn on top of leather armors, and it also fits the tribal aesthetic we are going for, so we might as well make some while we are waiting for better materials to tailor the next armor. And because Thoraya's nudity mood buff is also long gone, we might as well also give her the cape now, just to protect her a little better. After all, she is one of our best melee fighters and a vital member of the Cult of Jinx. On the next morning then, the tribute collectors have already moved on because of the cold, and for the most part the day remains uneventful. We are doing a bit of cleanup around the base, Spex is meditating, Coco is improving her connection with the woodmaker Garanlin tree and takes care of cooking, Thoraya is researching, Redini chops some stone blocks and builds our exterior wall, and Jack now remains in her workshop for most of the day. And so we already find ourselves in the late afternoon, as we have to give out yet another name, because another woodmaker dryad is ready to help us out. This one will now go by the name Lars, after patron Lars Moes, and with that, we now have three dryads producing wood for us, at least as long as Kipsaw is still around. Shortly after then, our caravan also arrives at the destination, so let's take a look at what we're dealing with. The smoke spewer is located in that central building here, the pirate guarding it is equipped with EMP grenades, so this should be easy, and we have a grand total of eight turrets surrounding the base, but I'm really not worried about those at all. So to get us started, let's attract some attention by firing at the solar panel here. That causes the lone defender to run straight at us, possibly in the attempt to bash our hands in with an EMP grenade. In any case, even without Maniac's stun ability here, we probably would have taken them out quickly, and so we now only have the turrets left to deal with. And this is going to be very easy, because Maniac and Took are both wielding great bows, and great bows outrange turrets by one single tile. Now that's not much, so we have to be careful, but if we pay attention, then we should be able to take out every single turret on this map without coming under fire once. And well, I don't think I need to show that off in detail 8 times, so let's jump ahead a bit. Here we are now, the last turret just exploded and the base is cleared. Or at least almost cleared, as we still have to take care of that smoke spewer. By the way, what this actually does is it only makes things a bit darker, I think it reduces overall light levels by about 10-15% to or something like that, so definitely nothing dramatic, especially not in the winter when we are not growing anything anyway, but of course we still want to get rid of it. And as you can see, that will take a while, but after about 3 hours of shooting, the machine finally collapses. 
Left behind are some components, steel and plasteel, and we will take some of that with us as we now load up our muffalo again. And we won't head home just yet, as there is an ancient complex nearby that we might want to investigate while we're here. And no, I am not going to channel my inner Francis John and disassemble the entire base, not only because Maniac and Took are both terrible at construction, but I also don't think that they would even understand what solar panels or components are at this point, and so we are only going to take those valuables that are right in front of us. As far as our colonists are concerned, the plasteel components and EMP grenades had to be good for something, otherwise our enemies would not be using them. On the next morning then, the smoke has lifted and our northern wall is also almost done, even though Thoraya does not exactly do her construction skill of 10 justice here by botching the construction of a simple door. Our two berry maker dryads meanwhile have hatched from their cocoons and are now dropping the first batch of fresh berries for us, which will immediately be hauled over to our very hungry muffalos. In the meantime, our small adventuring party has reached the next destination, so let's explore some ancient ruins, even though we will not receive any rewards for it other than what we will find on the map. Before we open up the structure, however, we can quickly kill ourselves an arctic wolf. After all, wolf skin is a great material for leather armors, and we already have a small amount back at home. As the wolf is then left to bleed out, we can begin things by deconstructing the wall over here. The entrance would be on the other side, but that's just inconvenient. So far, nothing dangerous or loot-worthy in sight, so let's open up the first door here and keep going. Alright, so we have an unstable fuel node in here, which means we do not want to come any closer for now, as it will otherwise explode and possibly set the entire structure on fire. Instead, we can try the other door and find a hermetic crate as well as a comms console. And let's open up the crate first to reveal six units of herbal medicine. Nothing crazy, but of course we'll take it. We will leave the console be for now, as using those can attract enemies if I recall correctly, so instead let's see what's in the next room. Nothing of interest so far, so let's keep going. And this looks better, another hermetic crate. And inside, six more units of medicine, a bit disappointing to be honest. There is another room next door though, so let's take a peek inside. And it turns out to be empty. So overall, a pretty unexciting adventure so far, but perhaps this next door reveals something a bit more interesting. Another crate, and this time we have... 18 units of luciferium, that is definitely more interesting, although we will probably sell it as soon as we can. Moving up to the other side of the structure, we now find a room with a fuel node and a crate, so we'll leave this one for last I think, and instead we'll dig our way into the last room next to it. That one contains an empty storage cylinder, so at this point we only have the comms console and that last crate left. And let's take care of the crate first, I think we should have enough time here to quickly get in, grab what's inside and get out. And inside we can indeed find another joy wire, so let's quickly pack that and then get out of dodge before the fuel node explodes. With a wall separating us from the fuel node, I think we also have enough time to hack the comms console now. And a few seconds later we have some cargo dropping in. 221 units of kibble, about to be a little less thanks to the local wildlife, but we should still be able to take a good part of that back home with us. Before we leave though, we can quickly chop up the arctic wolf and also pack up the meat immediately to prevent it from being eaten by other animals. And because we have one last thing left to do here on this map, we can also quickly put the kibble into the safety of our buffalo's backs. Finally then, with the sun setting, we can head south and hunt ourselves a timber wolf, for the exact same reasons as before, the wolf skin will make for a good armor down the line. Quickly chop that up, and now it's time to leave. And yes, we do have two more mission sites pretty close by here. However, visiting even one of them would probably extend the length of this trip by at least two days. And I think it's time for our two heroes to head back home before anything worse happens to Liviana. So let's pack up everything that we have gathered. The return trip will already take roughly two days. So again, for the next adventure, we're probably better off if we wait until the snow has melted. Back at home, meanwhile, we can take care of some quick rearrangements inside of Spex's bedroom, because Coco has finished her marble sculpture. 
and it is of excellent quality, boosting a beauty rating of 410, and it depicts an interesting scene that I would really like some of you to take a shot at. The description here speaks of Thoraya crouching next to a fire while her face slowly turns blue due to hypothermia, and the image is outlined by, and I quote, thousands of artichokes. So, that lovely image will now replace the crafting of Cambia inside of our common room. The old sculpture, meanwhile, moves into Spex's bedroom. A few moments later then, we also receive yet another quest, and once again the Empire is offering to shuttle four of our colonists over to an ancient complex to find out more about the Horn of Edmo. Now this time we also have some enemies present at the site, so that could be interesting. In any case, it sounds like something we want to take care of as soon as Maniac and Took return. For today, we can watch as Thoraya's intellectual skill of 7 finally unlocks us plate armor, which means we now have access to some truly heavy protection. Up next, I think we should look into great bows so that we no longer have to rely on enemies to drop those for us, but of course, as always, I would also be very interested to hear your suggestions. So feel free to leave those in the comments down below as we make the cut for today. Apologies that you had to wait so long for this next episode, but unfortunately my voice simply wasn't allowing anything earlier. We also don't have any fan art this week, or it got drowned out in the XCOM 2 character submissions, but I'm not complaining about that, at the very least it keeps me from having to talk anymore. So let's wrap things up, as always if you enjoyed the episode then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up, and if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.